Right after the first of the year, I was prompted to study the life of one of the greatest, if not the greatest, martial artists of the 20th century, Bruce Lee. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> Over the past few decades, I have been drawn to the arts of the East. When I was Baptist chaplain for a week one summer at Chautauqua Institute in New York State, our family had a wonderful experience with Qigong, the gathering of one's individual life energy with the world's energy around you. Vicki and I had a brief clumsy encounter with Tai Chi some years ago. And I like those old kung fu movies where two people fight way too many people, leap high in the air and do gymnastics defying movements I can only dream of attaining and attempting. Sometimes I just shake my head when I get these inner promptings because they are not logical nor understandable. But they are from way down deep. Something within me says, hold, stop, look, or listen more closely. Something is inbreaking, trying to, sp sp to speak to me in non-normal ways. I had never watched a Bruce Lee movie, nor did I know hardly anything about him. Vicky calls it my spidey sense. It is always something so out of the box from my normal life pattern that it appears bizarre. And in this case, throughout January, she gently posed this question several times is that your spidey sense going off? Translated, I believe that might partially mean, dear, do you think you really need to be studying that bloody fighting stuff? All is not always as it seems to appear. Bruce Lee was well read in philosophy, religion, and spirituality. His personal library included over 2,500 books. John Little, one of the foremost authorities on Bruce Lee in the world, says Bruce would say that his mission in life was to become a real human being. Lee created his own martial art, Jeet Kune Do. It looks towards balance and the big picture as opposed to learning just one particular art form such as karate or kung fu. One of his life applying philosophies that speaks to me is a statement he made about Jeet Kune Do. Not being tense, but ready. Not thinking, but not dreaming. Not being set, but flexible. Liberation from the uneasy sense of confinement. Jeet Kune Do, he says, is being holy and quietly alive, aware and alert for whatever may come. Just like Bruce Lee, that prompting happened again last month. Browsing the internet, this little book by Richard Rohr, just this, grabbed my attention. When I began reading the first of his 12 spiritual lifestyle practices, I was amazed at the coincidence. Because the first practice is beholding, which Rohr introduces as switching gears once in a while to be ready to perceive what is about to come at you. To be ready to perceive what is about to come at you. A master martial artist and a spiritual master with different paths, but in essence saying the same thing to me, be alert, aware, ready to perceive what is about to come at me. That's a wonderful deep way of describing behold. The word behold appears over 1,200 times in the King James Version of the Bible. As, pay attention, hear this, fix your eyes upon, see with attention, or observe with care. 
Newer translations use the words see and look, but no one word in English captures the translation of the Hebrew and the Greek. Still studying Bruce Lee, a couple films, magazines, and into the third book. My mind was happily absorbing and figuring out how to apply all that spoke to me, being present in the moment, not locked in the past or future, moving away from preconceptions in my mind, moving away from preoccupations I find myself in, not attaching or latching on to any object my mind finds so that I may be alive, aware, alert, and ready for whatever may come. But into that third book, I sensed my heart having reservations about what I was reading, so I stopped to ponder more deeply Lee's words and the movement of my heart. In the spiritual life, one hopes to live with the mind and the heart connected, not separate or disconnected from each other. They need to come together and live as one. Something was missing. Bruce Lee's philosophies are profound. They speak to me. As I continue to explore his life's work, I may discover what my heart sensed was missing in there. What my heart was calling into balance formed as a simple word, Awe, A-W-E. In a moment in time to experience a deep behold, we, to be ready to perceive what is about to come at us, all our preconceptions about how things ought to be, what should be happening, and what life of the moment should be like, according to us, needs to move aside. Our preoccupations, too, need to move aside so our mind is not latching onto anything that whirls around in it or zooms through it. Opening ourselves to awe, cultivating an awe disposition, letting awe fill our being, coupled to an open mind free of distractions, enables us to more fully behold God's active spirit in the moment. We can experience behold and beholding in different ways. We can behold a dogwood tree in all its glory, a sunflower, the water bug on its back in the hallway, sunrise on the peaks of the Grand Tetons, the constellation Orion. And they can spark awe in us, open us up, and bring us closer to the Creator. Or behold can come unexpectedly into our lives. Did Mary or Joseph know an angel was coming to them? Did the shepherds say to each other, Hey, bro, my Apple Watch just went off. In about five minutes, an angel's going to appear. No, no. Get up and look surprised. No, it didn't happen. The unexpected behold doesn't have to come from an angel. It can come as we sing a song like the Master's Calling. As we gaze on a symbol like the cross in the foyer, that incredible colorful quilt that hung in the foyer on Communion Sunday. As we meet the flickering light from the Lenten candelabra, as we express or receive a kind word or deed, as we experience an intense dream or through a prayer. We can experience behold even in this moment in time What is here in this moment of our church's life that God has a breath of newness to breathe, to announce, to call our attention, to have us behold? Are we ready to perceive that which is about to come at us? We turn to the three scriptures Carmel and Kenny read. Hopefully, these words will speak to us as a community as we immerse ourselves in several passages from Jesus' life. May we be able to perceive the different beholds in each one of them and allow them to speak to us. In the first scripture, Pilate, giving the crowd a choice between releasing Barabbas or Jesus, exclaims, Behold the man! To enable us to reflect more deeply, let's place ourselves in the scene as part of the crowd. 
gazing toward Barabbas and Jesus and ask, how are we responding to the Jesus Pilate presents when he says, behold the man? What are we as followers of Jesus beholding or not beholding? We know Pilate found no fault in Jesus. We know many making up the crowd shout for Barabbas as a release, not the release of Jesus, for they do not see Jesus as the king of the Jews. From this side of the cross and empty tomb, we believe Jesus is the son of God. But, we have, but have we come to know the story of Jesus mostly as beautiful savior and glorious Lord? Is it possible for the humanity of Jesus to speak to us? Notice the blood trickling down from the top of his head from the crown of thorns, the mocking purple robe and his battered face. Jesus is a real human being. He is in physical pain, probably emotionally moved by the aloneness, the words of Pilate against the shouts of the crowd, the sudden loss of friends who surrounded him for years, and dwelling on what he has chosen to go through in these final hours, to follow the call he hears from God for everyone surrounding him and for all of us. Behold the man, the man who is acquainted with grief. What does he silently say to us as we stand there in the crowd? Do we see him facing us, facing the crowd, taking in all the anger, the concern, the doubts, the belief, the mockery, the hatred, and the love, and the pain? What more? As people of God, can we behold his own pain and loss and allow it to speak to ours? Can we behold our own pain and loss? Do we have the courage to feel Jesus' pain and our pain? Can we express our pain and let others listen to it and hold it gently in their hearts? Can we listen to and hold their pain? What more, as people of God, created in the image and likeness of God, do we do with this pain, with our pain? Do we push it down deep inside and try to block out knowledge of the depths of our own lives? Is it human to keep our pain tucked away or closed off from the greatest source of healing, pray the pain. Beyond praying for the cause of the pain, pray the pain itself. Even if we cannot exactly name the pain, lift it up to God. Our humanity cries out for God. Pain doesn't belong shoved down inside our being. Pain must go the opposite way. Our pain, whether it's John's leaving as us as shepherd, whether it is living daily with family members in distress, whether it is pain endured at work, pain in our relationships, physical pain, mental anguish, accumulated abusive pain, pain piled up over the years, the pain we have for the world, or a combination of pain all wrapped up, whatever the pain, it must be pushed up to God, connected to God, prayed to God, who knows suffering, has suffered for us and suffers with us. Behold the man. Moving to the scripture Kenny read with Jesus hanging on the cross. Jesus sees his own mother standing with the beloved disciples, John. Let's place ourselves in the scene as either Mary or John. Mother Mary is watching her own son die a cruel and painful death. And John, John is the disciple that leaned on Jesus' chest at the Last Supper just hours before, hearing, tradition says, the heartbeat of God. Looking down from the cross, Jesus sees them together, Mary and John, and refocuses his mother's attention onto the two of them. Hanging above them, Jesus finds enough air to say, Woman, behold your son. 
son, behold your mother. He places them into each other's hands. They are to care for each other. Simple words, but deeply meaningful. The behold opens Mary and John up, and us up too, to more. Jesus gives Mary and John to each other as family, a family in and through faith. From the cross, Jesus, even in his suffering and agony, is still bringing the message of God, and by these words, has created a new family in God, a new reality. How do we see each other better? How do we behold each other? Are we not a large family in faith, placed in each other's care? And from these relationship-changing words from the cross, we may become aware of yet another depth to beholding. It is the deep reverence of the I-you relationship, the I-thou relationship, that respects and honors others beyond the borders and boundaries of who we are, our own life, respects and honors others beyond our own thoughts, feelings, and gut, beyond our personalness, reverence, respect, and honor that does not make other people outside of our own selves objects. In the beholding of others, we deepen relationships. If we dehumanize and treat people as objects, we have done the same to ourselves, and we are not recognizing that the other person, nor we, are created in the image and likeness of God. Beholding summons us to treat everyone subject to subject, person to person. Could Jesus be asking our unique mosaic community of University Baptist Church people, be ready to perceive what is about to come at you. Be ready to receive those you never thought would be family as family. Will we struggle to comprehend the how wide God's arms are and become that witness so that every person in our midst, whether we are in this sanctuary, whether we are at work, whether we are leisurely walking on the streets of our communities, every person that comes into our space can intuit from us Anthony DeMello's profound words at the top of our worship bulletin tonight. Behold, God beholding you and smiling. Behold the man, woman, Behold your son, son, behold your mother. In the last scripture Carmela read, Jesus appears to the 11 disciples after the resurrection. Let's place ourselves in the scene as a disciple and hear Jesus' words. Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. In the first scripture, when his life, his life was at the mercy of the crowd, we were beholding the man Jesus with many people, and we were distant from him. Now, as his close group of disciples, we find ourselves in a more intimate setting with the risen Lord. In the first scripture, we could only observe Jesus standing there. Now we're invited to touch and see Jesus, to touch and see Jesus' wounds, old wounds that are still there but have been changed, to behold his hands and feet, the places on him that were struck and bound to the cross. He is inviting us to draw closer to him, to behold that is really the Lord himself, the man that went through everything we saw and heard. Do we see the former Jesus has been transformed? Can we behold in awe a glimpse of newness and mystery 
that is. Do our hearts not leap in joy and amazement as we realize that truly indeed our Lord is risen? Hope is rekindled among us, seeing anew the one we spent years following. Rejoice, all is well, he is alive. Amen. But what about the intimate invitation? What about the invitation to behold, to touch, and see? How are we going to respond to the intimate invitation of our Lord and Savior? Are we going to just stand there, unmoving, perhaps afraid, puzzled, or happy and fulfilled? Or can we behold, can we fix our eyes upon, can we see with attention, can we observe with care that we are being called to him, to keep following him, to initiate movement towards him, to deepen our lives by touching him, by beholding him for all he is, and growing in the deep intimacy he offers. And as his disciples, like those disciples of Jesus, will we experience our Lord opening our minds to the word? Will we find our minds with the word descending into our hearts filled with awe? both united and connected. Don't leave the scene or stop beholding Jesus just yet. For in a moment when we do leave, we may discover a deep residual gift of beholding. I have stood at the Patuxent Wildlife Refuge beholding my favorite tree in awe and wonder. I have stood on the grounds of Hampton University offering to carry an African-American woman's heavy bag when suddenly engulfed in an intense I-thou relationship. And time stood still as strangers beheld each other. But until last week, an aspect of beholding remained unlabeled in my being until I sat long enough in this scripture. When we move out of beholding and back into our normal everyday stance, we leave brushed by the energy of God. We are empowered. In placing ourselves in the scriptures, we have been in the crowd watching Jesus stand in silence. Hanging from the cross, we have heard Jesus speaking to his own mother and his beloved disciple. We have been in an intimate space invited by Jesus to touch him and see him. What is it that connects and flows through these three moments in Jesus' life? What does our heart, the core place of our lives, need to deeply behold? It comes from beholding Jesus himself, holy and quietly alive, aware and alert, and surely often ready to perceive what came his way. If we are able to stay long enough and behold Jesus, perhaps our hearts will perceive his deep, deep love. Jesus standing with silent love trickling down. Jesus hanging on the cross with his arms stretched out wide as love enduring and creating. And finally, Jesus intimately inviting us, both through our minds and in our hearts, to touch and see God's transforming and everlasting love. It is the first day of Lent. In tradition, we are called to give up something or take on something that will assist us in drawing closer to God. Whatever you choose to do by yourself, whatever you choose to do with friends or family, whatever we may do together, gathered as peoples in God's place. May all of us switch gears once in a while during Lent, to be ready 
to perceive what is about to come at us. Behold. Amen.